Uzeni. Uh, I'm the founder and the CEO of uh, Flow.io. And, and this, this title doesn't look very technical, but this talk will be technical. And there will be heavy with demos and so on, because that's what I want to do. So hopefully, hopefully it will be interesting. So let's start about talking about the evolution of what we're doing right now. So here's what we see. When we are talking to our customer, with no exception, they're all trying to get, become more innovative. So they do a kind of like a transformation uh, journey. And they always start with what everybody's talking about it today, which is microservices. They have a little application, it's one big binary, and they are really, really interested in integrated to microservices. And again, we'll talk in a second about why. But then when they're moving there, what they will discover is that there is the challenge of rewriting the application, but that's when it's only start. And actually, it was way more complex after it. For instance, simple stuff like, now you have way more API. How do you manage that? Or some problem like, how something simple, like two services, how do they communicate to each other? How do you make sure that they communicate in a really, really safe way, in a secure way? And then, how do you make sure that you understand what's going on with all those microservices right now? And all of these problems today solved by a technology called my uh, service management. So that's kind of like the next thing that everybody's talking about. So we will go on it and we will drill quite a lot on this. But I personally believe that actually what's special about service mesh, it's not the three problems that people claim that it's solving today, which is security, routing, and observability. I believe that the beautiful of service mesh is the technology itself. What we just did, we're basically abstracting the network. And if we're abstracting the network, there is way more we can do. And that's the beyond, right? We're specifically focusing, for instance, on the health, but there is a lot more to do because the way the technology is right. So this is really, really high level, just to explain you what today people are doing. Now we're drilling into, and we'll try to focus on understanding the identification. Okay, so microservices. Uh, so microservices improve us a lot of stuff we talked about it, right? Uh, first of all, uh, you're just getting better agility, right? Like it goes so fast. In our company, we, we seriously, I don't know, probably doing like 10 pull requests a day. We're going really, really fast. And the reason is because you can, right? Now you abstract everything right, everything is way small, and you can go very fast. It's the right design. We actually, if we have to design an application, that's the right way to do this, right? It's abstract, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, make sure that it's encapsulated the logic in the right places and so on. And it's very flexible. I don't care which language you use, I don't care what you're doing, it's just really, really letting you go. Take all the constraints that you want. That's great, but there is a lot of problems that it's creating. So suddenly everything is in the network, right? You have two microservices. Right? Before that, they all was in one binary. You didn't really take, needed to take care of the traffic thing. Right? Because one binary is pretty simple. But now, it's distributed. And with distributed, there is a lot of problems. So the complexity, understand what's going on. Now you don't have the application in one place with all the logic that it will be pretty simple to figure out. There's a lot of microservices. There is a duplication here, right? You have a replication of each of them. So how do you understand what's really going on? Of course, performance, again, we have that. Before that, the majority of the problem that you have with your application is, you know, bugs and to see that it's working well and so on. But now we're putting everything on the network, so latency could be a big problem for your application. You need to make sure that your microservices are resilient to that. And that's, I mean, you know, this is an all new story. In terms of cost, of course, you know, it's harder. There is a lot more tools that need to be distributed. It's complicated. And the last one is the testing. So if before that, I could run some unit tests, you know, and, and be very happy, some integration tests. Now it's hard to be into the integration test. It's really complex. There is a lot of, 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 uh, of moving forward. So, you know, again, we, like everything that we're doing in our community, and I'm, you know, I'm in the open source community really active, is that we're always solving the problem. But then we're introducing a field of new problems to solve. And that's where the opportunity is coming for companies like Solo, like Reddit, right? Like you. Okay, so again, just kind of like I will go and iterate just to make sure that I don't know the level, so I'm going to make sure that everybody understands what I'm talking about. So again, everything was before that in one big binary. We, all the logic of the application built in. If you want to scale it, you have to scale all the application, all those binaries. Even if it means that only one of the little logic is the one that you need to scale, you still need it to scale, which is very, you know, expensive. Now we did, we took it and we spread it to a lot of, of but we kind of like lost the state of the application. Because if before that I could just, for instance, attach a debugger to my binary and understand what's going on, now I can't because
because there is so many and each of them doing different stuff. I can't just attach a debugger. The spread is, the stage is spread all over the place. And I'm giving a very nice example here, like how many we have, like seven microservices. But this is the real world, right? This is what we do. There's way more, right? And this is an example of the amount of microservices that you're supposed to manage. Um, and then you go into Twitter and you see that kind of stuff, right? And this is true, this is what we're dealing with today, right? <laughs> so, so again, really, really important, we did a huge move to actually go to the right direction that we brought a lot of complexity with us and we need to help fix that. Um, it's not finishing on the application itself. Now it's also going back to the tooling, right? Most of the people that I know, most of the customers that we have today has a monolithic application. And the way they need grading is not by, oh, the right way to be is not to just rewrite it. Because you know, they're working on this and they continue adding feature, and there's a big problem organization between the new team, the old team. There is a lot of problems. What you really need to do is to do what Leaf did, what Twitter did, which is somehow find a way to glue those applications together, add more microservices, and kind of like look to the user like it's one big application, and then start ripping it up. So that means that in the current situation, you may have an application that builds more than only microservices uh, architecture, but also still the monolithic. Or maybe you want to go all the way to serverless. And that means that you have a different tool to take care of. So this is an example. But maybe if before that APM did the work for you, now there is way more load. A lot more metrics, a lot more busyness in your cluster, and therefore permitting is probably the right solution. When we're talking about logging something before the head, you know, just took the log from the, from the host, it should be fine. But now it's all distributed and replicated. So how do I know where the transaction left, where to take the logs from? And what you're doing in that case, you're doing something called transactional logging. And that means that you need to give an ID in the beginning of the transaction and make sure that it's followed all the way from all the microservices and then take the log based on this, this transaction to make sense of everything. Way more complex. So you need something like open telemetry. So there was, I'm just going to say that there was before that they calling it open tracing, then Google decided to compete and they calling it open consensus, and now they merge together under the open telemetry. So that's what I put here. In terms of debugging, I don't know, when I was debugging my microservices, my monolithic application, I just attached the debugger, DLB, you know, GDB. This is the one that I know how to do. When I came and I had one of the engineers, I worked in EMC before, and I had one of the engineers in Pivota, and basically by the problem, I said to him, okay, let's attach debugger. And he said to me, debugger? Because you're not debugging anymore, right? What you're doing is you're printing, you're troubleshooting, you're taking log. We're not debugging anymore. That's not what we're doing anymore. So if you're looking in the old style, we code, you know, you cannot do it with native debugger. Today, you can't apply that to Microsoft. Uh, Architecture, you know that, but from SOA, we moved to microservices. Uh, for, maybe I'm looking. <laughs> for deployment, so you know, again, if before that you could have used something like configuration management, that will not make sense anymore. So you will need to move to something like Elm or any, any deployment, you know, object in Kubernetes. Um, and then the last one is testing. Again, before that, it was a lot of unit tests and a little bit of integration tests. Now it's all different, right? A little bit of, the, of, of unit test, but a lot and very massive integration tests. So again, it's all. And in the nutshell, this is what happened. We took this monolithic application, we cut out the small pieces, the moving it, the connection right now is through the internet and simple form, like as I said before, how microservices can communicate to each other. How they're going to do it in a very secure way and how we understand what's going on, what, what, what's going on in the system, it's a problem that we need to solve. It's a new problem that we need to use. And those are the problems that Service Mesh is trying to uh, make. So Service Mesh, uh, I don't know, anybody, like, do you, are you aware of Service Mesh? Any of Yes, oh, maybe it's really more okay. <laughs> We'll go a little more faster if that's the case. So what is Service Mesh? So Service Mesh today is trying to solve three major problems. The first one is security, right? So what it's going to do is going to build a certificate for you, MPLS, uh, and policy. If we're talking about observability, we're going to do, they're focusing on metrics and logs, and if you're talking about routing, we're going to talk about uh, traffic control and resilience, something like fault injection, like quick rise and so on. Uh, this is in the natural, again, just to people that don't know, and trust me, we're going to go very, very fast on this, and then we'll do stuff for you. 
So in the end of the day, you have the microservices, and what we're doing in service mesh, we're putting what's called a sidecar proxy next to it. And what we're doing is we're treating, treating the IP table that every communication to the microservice and every communication out of the microservice is going to go through this proxy. And this proxy is something that I can configure. If I can configure it, I can control a lot of this stuff. Um, yes. So this is in the natural IO cluster we look right now. You will have five, in that, it does not have five microservices. The first thing that you will need to do, you still need to do that. Right. At the end of the day, you need to make sure that the entry to the cluster is very secure, it's very safe. You don't want to, it doesn't make sure specifically in microservices that, they, that, they, that, you know, that the people themselves, that the developer would take care of security and so on, probably can abstract it from them. That's exactly what the IGET is doing. And that will take care of everything that related to the traffic that is known to sell. The other thing that it's going to do, you're going to put a site down next to every microservices, and that's what's going to take care of the traffic of east-west. So you have a lot of proxy now, so I want to manage them. And you know, API get will manage the proxy on the edge, right? Because the version should be different, you know, it's a little bit more dangerous because it's coming and you don't know from where. Versus when the communication is between two microservices, which already go through one of the API gateway, and that will get the configuration for the service mesh control plan. So what will happen is that every time that the traffic coming to your cluster, it will go to the proxy of the edge, and every time that the traffic moving inside the cluster, it will go, it will go from the proxy that configured by the service mesh. So it's pretty simple. Now you're abstracting it, right? It's pretty simple. Every communication between them is being cached. It can go be logged. It can be able to make it speed definition. For instance, what you know, can you allow them not allowed to talk to these guys? Is that secure and so? Okay, so in the nutshell, because a lot of you know service mesh, let's not focus on this. I mean, I explained what it is. It's really cool. There is a lot of companies that are building it right now. I didn't feel as a company that I want to put my resources to build it. I mean, we're helping, but I didn't want that to be the major thing that we're doing. Because I believe that it's everything we're doing. We, we what, but actually introducing this technology, there is way more complexity than we're getting into the picture. And what I try to figure out is what will be the next problem after service mesh will be in commodity. So let's look right now in the market. Here is the market in the nutshells, right? This is what my customer is doing, or any customer that I have. They start in with ST. Why? Google, right? It's pretty simple. A lot of marketing, they will start with STL. So ST is a, is a, is a service mesh uh, based on Android proxy that came from Google. They will start with it, and very quickly they will discover that it's way too complicated. Like everything, Google is really good in Geneva. Oh my God, everything is overcomplicated. And to be honest, most of my customers doesn't have the need that Google has in their infrastructure. So you know, we don't care so much to make it so complex. So they will start with that, and they will most likely will fail. That's the honest to that. They will wait for Red Hat or another company to have the solution. Then they will move to Linkerd. So the first serverless actually coming, a service mesh actually came from a company called Boyan. The people who worked in Twitter and did a lot of service mesh there, they basically got out, they announced this to Linkerd, and the first version of it, they created with a Java sidecar. <coughs> Swear to God, if people are calling usually a sidecar a sidecar, this Linkerd was a bus car. It was huge, and it didn't actually pop up, it was crazy. So it wasn't really um, working, it wasn't perfect solution. Therefore, SDO and Google started and decided to compete. But they created a new one, and they call it a, 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 a Linkerd DQ now, and basically they based it on their own proxy, reading in Rust, that the control plan in Go. So people will try that. But here's the problem that we will discover. It's not built on Android. And here's the thing. We are contributing to Android. Google contributed to Android. AWS is contributing. I should call everybody is contributing to Android. And therefore, you know what? We're going to go way faster. This is the power of the community. And therefore, they just cannot keep up with the feature that Android is having. So they kind of like a little bit behind. Uh, so people will be very afraid to bet on that, and they will move to something like console. We specifically are very good friends with Ashikov. We helped them build the first version of, of uh, console, but they are behind. They just recently announced a several layer support. And to be fair, that's in several, several as in my opinion, service match. The only thing that is interesting is that they are separate. We brought everything to the application. So if they don't have it, it doesn't really matter. They're also behind, and they're not giving the support on the proxy itself, but they're actually not contributing to Android. They're just operating it. And you will see more and more, and maybe if you're an AWS, you will go to AppMesh, which is their solution. 
it's free, so you take care of it with everything that they have, but it's really, really young. So again, our customer is trying. And a year goes by, and they never run any the product because it's too complex. So all this investigation was way, way easier if we put some obstruction on top of it. And that will solve us a few problems. The first one, we can come with an easier API than SD cards. That's right, and I'm sure we can do that because it's so complicated that my daughter can do it. Then the second thing that we can do is we basically can have the ability that if a customer wanted to try, they don't need to learn all those APIs. It's enough that they will learn one API that is very solid and have them all. The other thing is that even if they wanted to start with LinkedIn, but they felt that LinkedIn will not be the winner one, and we all know that people choose before that map and Mesos and Cloud Foundry and Docker Swarm, they needed to throw away all the stuff that they didn't want. So most likely, again, what they will do is that they will want to switch. With this abstraction layer, they can do that. And then the last one is that, um, again, just keep it dead simple. So that's what we did. And actually, in the last, you know, we announced our own project called SuperGlo a year ago. The vision was, again, is the first one is to make an abstraction that's easy to work. When I'm using STO, I need to create four different objects to define the service in order to give a retry. Why? That doesn't make any sense. Let's just let them do a retry and we will do the back and all this stuff. So we, we created those API and in our product was doing installation of service mesh, our product was doing discovery if you already have it installed, a very simple way to, now when you have a list of all the service mesh to manage that, and also grouping them together. Because what if I have two instances of service mesh on-prem, and I have AWS app mesh, and I want to treat them as one big cluster. Service mesh will let you do this. If we would be able to actually group them together and flag the networking, because all of them using Envoy, you can do a very interesting stuff. So we did all of this, and Microsoft reached out to us. They are the only cloud that basically doesn't have a story for, for a, a service mesh. So they basically reached out to us and said, we really like your story, and we wanted to actually take these things and put it up. So we announced in the last book, and this is a, a game for my Microsoft, we announced SMI, Service Mesh Interface. That's basically an API that's making way simpler than, than STO and others, and it's just making the interface of if someone wanted to do service mesh, that's what you need to by owner. And because it's Microsoft, they managed to convince uh, a buoyant from uh, LinkedIn and Ashikov to join this and a lot of other companies are including Reddit and we become creating this nice community. And the reason we did all of this, us as a company, is because what I think that is very interesting is what is going to come on top of it. Yeah? Right? So this is what we did with service mesh, right? The first thing that we did is if before that, all this logic of the application, all the operation logic was built into your application. And every time that there is someone needed to change in a, you know, a library to upgrade, you need to upgrade your microservices, now we took it out. And if we took it out, there was way more we can do. And that's what we did, right? We're basically putting the stuff on top of the service mesh. We make it an easy to work with. So the first thing that we're doing, we have our own API gateway that is very innovative, built like a, you know, declarative API, CRD base, microservices, built on top of a called Google. So you know, we basically created a plugin that will work seamlessly with every service mesh. The second thing is that we believe that everybody should do this, community, a customer, and so on. And when we're doing this, basically if you think what we did, we kind of like created a platform, right? An iPhone, or something like that. What do you have in iPhone? You have the ability to some applications that are coming built in. And the reason it's coming built in is because that giving you the ability, that's the basic functionality that you need in your phone, right? For my opinion, the basic functionality that you need right now to your infrastructure should be an API gateway and a service mesh. Together, they abstract all your network. And that's really, really important. But like iPhone, there is an app store. You can actually extend it. And that's exactly where we're going with this. So chaos engineering on top of service mesh. Sounds way more sense because you don't need to put an import library to your code. It's not a code specific. You can actually just inject it on the proxy level. Uh, same thing, something like canary deployment. It's make a lot of sense. If it's not doing the service mesh, what do API get? But we need to make sure that it will get there, right? And that's exactly the next thing that we did. So I will share a little bit what we're doing. It's all open source. Everything is open source. So go and try that. And I will share some demos and then we'll see them. Is finals so, so far? Yeah. Are you still with me? I didn't ask nothing. So I know it's a lot of fun. So, okay, so let's see. Let me just move the content. 
So what I have here is a very simple, let's just uh, the Elliot, that you all want to see what I have. Basically, I'm just showing you everything that I have in the cluster right now. So I have a Kubernetes cluster, and what you can see that in my cluster I have the name, the, you know, the pods of Kub system, right? I have a Kubernetes, and I already installed STO. Pretty simple, I just took the young one did it, right? So now, let's look at what we did. So we, it's, it's free again, you can always go to do it. If you're going to do it, something called service mesh out, .io. You can just get a read-only version of what we built. And basically what it is is that I'm just managing app mesh, I'm managing STO, and I'm managing major data. But this is, of course, a read-only one because, you know. So let's just go and live, install it on our cluster. So it's pretty simple. The only thing that I'm going to do right now, you saw it's an empty cluster. Oops, sorry. Maybe I'll do this. And I'm just basically installing right now on my cluster. So I'm taking the service mesh out, install it locally in my cluster because that's what it means. It makes sense to want to implement. So basically, I'm just installing it. We'll download some uh, container. It's pretty simple. Um, we can just verify right now that it's installing it. You can see movement here. It's fantastic. And we'll do the next thing, which is basically port forwarding. Now, everything that I'm doing right now is in the UI just because it's cool to demo. But actually, everything is based on CRD on behind the scenes. So everything that I'm doing right now is, can be done with CTL, with RCLI, or with UI. So Okay, two, so the last one and we're all set. It's a live demo, so I know. Is that good? Okay, good. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is port forwarding to bring it to my computer. And the last thing that I will need to do is to come here and basically look at the local host. Here. And what you can see is that in my cluster, they already recognize that there is an STO uh, discovered. They already discovered the STO that's running. They see that it's healthy. And they actually also recognize already which service they have a sidecar injected. Right? So it's pretty simple. Discover that and it's great. The other thing, you know, just to show you how simple it is, I can come and just for fun of it, let's go install a, another one. Let's do it for dev. And let's do it LinkedIn just for fun. Let's put it on namespace uh, LinkedIn and just go ahead to install it. So I just installed an STO. I had it already installed. Now I'm installing LinkedIn on a different namespace and I'm ready to go. Uh, so it's starting as you can see. And while I'm doing it, what we're going to do, we're going to go to STO itself and we're going to extend it. So what does it mean extend it? But as you know, a lot of the time, like for instance, scale is coming already with uh, with X. But there's a lot of stuff that service mesh is not coming with. For instance, Canary deployment. Flutter is an open source project from WeWorks. So what it's doing is exactly this. It's taking your Kubernetes and it, your service mesh and it's making sure that you'll be able to generate your, your deployment. You know, it's, it's watching a Prometheus. If you see any problem, it's rolling back. Pretty simple, right? Um, but what you can see is that when you're deploying actually the Flutter, there's a lot of work that you need to do. So what we've done is pretty simple. We already know which Prometheus you use. So we took Elm, plus customized, and created a very strong uh, deployment system that will allow us to basically go there and understand what, you know, basically uh, customize it. So basically, we layer the configuration. Um, we can, again, we can just for fun go and do PI right now on, on SDO, and basically to be as simple as now. So, right? It's just we're going to come here, we're going to choose a namespace. PI is a simple example because it's anyway coming with, but, right? And what you can see that we're going to the mesh as we already installed another mesh, which is the dev, it's already working, it's already discovered all the service folders and the sidecar. And what we're going to do next is just install an API gateway. We need to install an API gateway. That's this is our R1 that built, so we can install it on STO, can install it on LinkedIn. Let's install it on LinkedIn because LinkedIn doesn't have any API gateway. 
of coming here and again. It's pretty simple. This is like straightforward. This is, will be the future eventually for the enterprise. Now, everything that I did right now is based on a ridiculously amazing technology of behind the scenes. So go or, or look at it. It's all ready and go. And it's pretty, pretty neat. So it's really, really, uh, you know, pretty simple. And you know, I can show you that actually it's still a Kiali, but that's kind of like on the beginning. So then in the nutshell, did you get right what we're doing here? It's just that you have Uberized dimensions. In the end of the day, that's what you need to do. You need to group them together, also we'll flat them, and there's way more we do. So just in a nutshell, that makes sense so far? Okay, cool. So if I want to go faster, so I'm going to move to what next, and then I'll show you something really, really delicious. Okay. So what next? So there is a lot of problem in service mesh. This is an example of a tweet that came in the internet. Actually, that was a long time ago because right now I still is way more than 40 k. I think it's like 60 or 70 uh, API call. So you thought of Kubernetes and stuff, wait until you actually need to figure out what to do with STL. Um, and if you think about it, there is two things that you need to do in service mesh in terms of the configuration. The first one, you need to actually configure, configure the mesh itself for gateway, you know, internal, external, MPLS, that's one thing. But then you have also the day-to-day -day configuration that are more active. For instance, you're putting a new application, so routing and so on. So for the routing and the day-to-day, -day -day, we already make it better with SMI, right? It will be way simpler and you will be able to do this. But what we didn't do is for the configuration itself, and that's where most of the pain for our customer are, is that, you know, when you're actually deploying Docker, you're not starting from scratch, right? I mean, you never start from scratch anymore. There is those layers in a Docker file that you can actually start from every point you want. But when you're installing service mesh, you're starting from scratch. So we think that we can do better. And what we did, we basically layer the configuration. We're calling it flavor. And you can actually, if you can discover a flavor of a cluster that exists, or you can create one, and then basically you can actually go and apply. So you can say, I want this service mesh for these clusters, with this flavor, with this configuration, with this everything, and just, yeah. Okay. The second thing is that it's the biggest problem that exists today in every organization for adopting service mesh is this. Every time that the application owner wanted to push an application, the first thing that you need to do is to deploy those, you know, to create those libraries, networking, platform, policy, telemetry. And that's all from the, you know, this is the, the example of MST. And then I just click on the networking, and that's some of the file. I couldn't put all of them because we want to play for a YAML that you would expect an application owner to create. Now, that doesn't make any sense at all. I don't know an application owner that's capable of doing it. I don't want my application owner to even know that I have a service mesh. So the question is how to get this, this is the biggest problem. Now, it's not that surprising because, as I said, STL being done by a Google engineer, and Google engineer probably can do it all. But most of them, the, the enterprise, you do not want the user to know that. You don't want the application owner to understand that. So one thing that we're doing is we basically need to come with kind of like a CI CD system, a plugin maybe, and kind of like an interface between the application owner and what they are, and translate that to all those young stuff. And the last one is that service mesh troubleshoot. So here's what we just created. Something is wrong. Your application is not working. Here's where you should look at it. The first one, maybe it's a proxy problem. The second one, maybe it's a service mesh problem. The third one, maybe it's an API a gateway problem. The last one, maybe it's a service mesh interface problem. Where do you look? How do you find the black? It's crazy. So this is another something that we're working on right now. We're basically taking all the CRD from all of them and all the snapshots. We're making sure and we can actually understand where the problem is and notify that. Okay, so that was a lot. I'm trying to get the better. Ten, ten more minutes. So I will do this. I really, really want to show you something really, really cool. Uh, and that's, that's something that I'm passionate about. It. We open source, we're working on it with Lyft and we open source it very soon and I'm really, really excited about it. Okay, so when I looked at, when we talked about the debugger before, I was, when I saw that my engineer doesn't know what debugger is, the first thing that we did is create a project called Squash. And what Squash is doing is basically orchestration for debugger. So I will run, I will show you how it's working with demo, and then I will show you how we took it to the service mesh for the end of the production. So that will be a more difficult demo. So I'm just going to spin it up. So give me a second. You don't really need to worry about it, it's scripted. So in a second, what you will discover, you know, I'm just spinning up the cluster, spinning it up. In a second, it will be up. 
And what Squash is basically doing is very, very simple. It's giving you, bringing the regular debuggers that we work with it all the time, all the way to your ID and be able to actually install them, you know, basically use them in, 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 a, in Kubernetes environment. It's not related to serverless, it's just Kubernetes. It's free and it's open source, really offer you to go and look at it. In a second it will work and I will show you what's that going on. So when I'm clicking on this, it's immediately going and to me which namespace we want to debug. So I'm going to say calc, because that's the application. It will tell me, look, in calc you have two pods. Which one do you want to debug? And I'm going to go with two, service two. And then it will tell me, well, in service two you have two things. You have the ST of sidebar, and you have the actual service. Which one you want to debug? Let's go with the service. And then it said to me, which debugger do you want to attach to it? And that's where really it go, so we'll go with the LP. And that's basically what I do. So he asked me some question about what I want to do. And in a second, what you've seen is that there's some magic behind the scene, and I'm attached. I can go right now, easily go to an application, go to back to my application, put some numbers, put an element of which, and I'm like debugging it. So that's pretty simple, and this is helpful. Of course, if you have more than one microservice, you can attach a different, like for instance, a lot of the demo that I'm doing is taking a Java debugger, a Go debugger, and then jump between three and show you how we doing it. So that's a pretty simple one, and it's really successful project. But here's the problem. The problem is that, and you know, there is, you can't use it in production. This is a debugger. No one is insane enough to take his, his debugger and you know, GDB and attach to the microservice and look up in production. So the question is, how can we bring this easiness to production? And this is a cluster of production, and this is what happened, right? This is how you're going. You know, you have that pod, you have microservices, maybe they're going through a database, and they're going through. If you want to know what's going on and how to solve it, today a lot of the things that people are doing is they're basically using open telemetry. That means they want all the logs that exist in this application. But here is the problem. To take all the logs from all of this is very expensive. So there is two limitations for open telemetry or open tracing. Number one, they're only going to take the address. They can't take the byte, it's too expensive. You, all this stuff is flying on the network, it's going to take it down. The second thing, sampling. Sampling is the art of, uh, of uh, open uh, tracing. You can't take it all, choose, right? Okay, so that's option number one. So maybe service mesh will solve us this problem. Now if you go to the sidecar and do exactly the same thing. But actually, it's not going to solve us the problem. It's exactly the same problem, right? And the problem is that you still cannot take everything. You can't take everything. So it's let me think, do I really need everything? I don't need everything. Why do I need everything? I only care about the one that went wrong anyway. So what if we created a, a I can be able to record every traffic, all this traffic inside the policy because I have a service. So that means also the response from the database, from S3, everything that was in production. Now, in the end of the, the transaction, everything is good. I really don't care about that. I'm just passing it. It's never going out from my node, right? It's not going to the network. But if there is something wrong, and something wrong should be, be defined by the user, we're giving the tool to do this, then I want to save it. I want to save the body. I want to save the error. I want to save everything, right? Including the data that went through the internet. And we're calling it loop, right? It's basically a recorder. We're doing it with Lyft, Lyft using it in a different use case. If something, you know, someone calling them because the lift is not here, they're clicking on button with their support and basically recording everything that's related to this specific user to let their engineer to rerun. And that's exactly what we're doing. Loop can help you rerun it with Squash. So again, last demo in this where I'm done. And it's really, really quick. Uh, so what, what now what we're going to do is something really, really simple. Okay, 
So what we're going to do is something very, very simple. We created a CLI for loop CLI. Everybody can use it. If I'm looking and I'm doing loop CTI list, you will see that it's going to be different. So anyway, I can show you how it's working in this way. My bed is just, uh, never mind, I didn't record it, but I will show you in a second. But basically, what we have is we have this application, and every time that something is happening and everything is good, it's not doing anything, and I will show that in a second. But if something is wrong, we're basically recording it, and then we can replay it with attaching the debugger, injecting the information that happened in production where that's happening, which just basically let you rerun it in a second. While this happened, I think it was a lot of material. So is the, I'm done. There is any question, and I can show you the demo. Yeah. environment, I, there's no debugger at all. That's too dangerous. I'm not going to attach it. What there is, is there is a TAPS filter that we extended in endpoint that basically record all this information. And when, the, when it's needed, when there is catching something because it's matching to what I asked you, or whatever, response of 500, saving it outside. So now I have all the data that was in production. I can spin up another environment. I can attach the debugger. And then I can inject the data like it was in production including what came from the database. And it's a sort of simple, right? It's, it's pretty simple to do this. And I can show you that. Yeah, okay, so now it's better, so let me just show you the demo. Um, so what you can see is basically that I have loop CTL, there's nothing there, right? There's nothing recorded yet. I did this define it. And now there is this application that we talked about it before. And basically, it's working most of the time, as you saw before. But sometimes people are saying that it's doing some internal error. And I don't know, so let's just play with this a little bit more. You know, I mean, let's see, it's actually working. I don't know what they want. Uh, let's see. Let's try this. So, implemented a implementation of OpenZip in my company. One of the issues that we have, as far as the sort of you alluded to, it only captures the bad things that happen. Let's yeah. say 20 nodes are involved in a request. 
across the null half state, and I have failures across three nodes, and I actually the transaction is across all 20, and I actually want the state from across all 20. Have you guys solved that problem? Yeah, so staging is not something that we will take. There is a state to your location itself. Mm -hmm. No. But in microservices, the 12 factor app, hopefully you don't have state. It's really bad if you have state. So it's, it's not so much that the state is like, you know, shared. It's more like you're passing parameters. Let's say I have yeah, but the problem, why that's a problem? I, because I'm on the sidecar, I can actually, I'm, everything is going through me. So every parameter that came through here, every way that it's going anywhere, that I get, mm -hmm. right? And what, where it's, you know, and again, what it's bad is like, assume that there is a cascade error. Maybe it did work somehow in the first one, that there's something. That's why we're saving all of this, right? Because it's important to us. And in the end, we're making a decision. Mm -hmm. But that shouldn't be a problem, because I'm saving very little in the proxy, and we have some, uh, a lot of times like that, uh, Way to make it very optimized. But okay. Yeah. So, but you capture it at the the failures of the nodes. It doesn't. You can't trigger like capturing from the nodes that were successful previously in the request. Like that's not a thing. That no, but what I can do is this: a request coming to the node. I don't know if it's failure yet or not. It's just coming. We are saving all of them okay. until the end of this transaction. Now the transaction is finished. We evaluate that. Mm -hmm. Right. We're saying, well, you know, in, there is a problem with node three. I'm taking all of this, all these huge transaction. And I'm basically saving it and let you rerun. So I have all of this, even one that's successful, in this transaction. But if all of this transaction is good, I toss it. I don't care. Okay. I'm not taking it off. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I think we have time for one more. I just said that we are in Boston and we are hiring in Cambridge, <laughs> actually. <laughs> so join us. Is there any other questions? Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.